Hey guys, today's video is a bit of a different approach than my normal storytelling, but I hope you will sit back and listen because it is very important. I think by now everybody in the world knows what's happened to Afghanistan. The Taliban overthrew the government and they're in control of the country and it's devastating. Uh, the lives of 35 million innocent people are in danger. Um, and I've never felt so personally and emotionally affected by anything that's happened in the world because Afghanistan is one of my favorite countries. Ever since I first went in 2018, I fell in love with the lifestyle, the beauty, the people, the food, the ancient wonders, and the, the culture is just so pure and, and, and authentic and the way that people dress and the way they live their life and they're so hospitable. I can go on and on about my love for Afghanistan because it's the truth. I've traveled eight provinces. I've made about 20 videos on YouTube, which I hope you guys have been able to see the good side of the country. And a lot of questions have been coming in about Noor, my tour guide, my good friend, and the person who I've literally spent every second with. I've had to stay silent until now to protect his safety, but I'm proud to tell you that he is now safe with his wife and kids in Australia. Um, we've been texting throughout the process, but we haven't been able to get a phone call in or Zoom. Um, but right now we are going to be doing a video call, which he agreed that I can record it and share it with you guys. Um, he's going to be telling you all about the struggles, what happened, what he saw, and how he managed to be one of the very lucky ones to escape at Kabul airport. But before we dive in, I want to tell you about two fundraisers if you're interested to donate. The first one was started by my friend Matt, which is helping all Afghan fixers and tour guides and their colleagues. And the other one is started by my friend Omid, who is helping women find food, shelter, and safety in Afghanistan. So you can find both links to the fundraisers below and all the proceeds of this video are going to be donated into both fundraisers. I'm gonna split it and I'm gonna donate in both of them. So just by watching this video, just know that you are contributing. So thank you guys. And now I'm going to call Noor for the very first time. Hey man. How are you, sir? Everything okay? I'm so happy to see you, man. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you too, Drew. It has been a long time. Oh my God, I haven't seen you in what, nine months? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was October 2020. We have a lot to talk about, but first off, I'm so happy that you're safe. Um, you got, you're in Australia. Yeah, yeah, sir. Thank you. I am in, uh, in, in, in Australia right now. I'm, I'm talking to you from Melbourne. Wow. How does it feel to be in Melbourne right now? It's good. Uh, it looks like a very nice city. The other day I was filming a little bit when I was in the bus. Right now we're in, in quarantine. It's uh, our fourth day here in the hotel. You're with your wife and kids? Yes. Uh, the people are really nice. They, they really take good care of us here. They're very well organized and, uh, you know, they're very kind. They give us food all the time and whatever we need, they, they call and ask if we need medications and stuff like that. Before we get into life in Australia, um, let me back up a bit. When I saw you last, one thing I love about you is that you're so proud of your country and, and you, you've always been so happy to be a tour guide and you've always loved everything about Afghanistan. I remember you telling me, like looking in my eyes and you said the moment the U.S. pulls their troops, we're in trouble. Um, but you but you always told me that you would never leave your country unless you had to leave and like unless you were forced. And unfortunately, things went really bad. And, and I've never felt so personally affected with anything um, in the world ex than this, because, you know, my heart is in Afghanistan. When did you start to realize things are getting really bad? It was uh, it was like, yeah, it was like two months ago. Taliban started their advancements around Afghanistan and they were taking like far away districts. And it was like a kind of bill of danger ringing in our ears. And uh, I had some clients coming and uh, still I was working and there were some nice people who wanted to see Afghanistan in the last minutes. Right. And uh, so Taliban... Uh, took through many faraway districts and in in one week they they took like seven to eight districts and it was like a very bad news for me and uh, I thought it's uh, it's crazy you know if if in one week they like every day if they take one district it means like in another six months there there will be nothing remaining but I said it's okay no problem we, we still have we I still believed in our army I still believed in our chairman yeah. and politicians i thought they're going to fight against afghanistan and i was very hopeful and still people were emailing me and asking me if they can visit afghanistan and i said uh yeah sure it's okay no problem still 
Mazar was okay, still Herat and Kabul yeah. and Bami and the locations that you visited were all fine. And uh, I thought they're big cities of Afghanistan. It's very difficult for them to be falling into the hands of Taliban. So I encouraged people to come to Afghanistan. And uh, yeah, suddenly after, after like another two weeks, they just reached at the gates of Mazar Sharif as, as, as I knew we were in contact and uh, you were always worried, but thank you so much to your worries and, and caring and everything. Yeah, they were just the gates of Mazar Sharif and uh, they, were, they were almost inside the town and people really fought against them. And I'm not sure what, what happened in the government. Somehow I feel that the president of Afghanistan and the chairman of Afghanistan made a deal probably with Taliban, which was all the promise they made. I think they were just a lie. I think they were fake. They just gifted Afghanistan to the Taliban, you know. And uh, right after they were at the gates of Mazar Sharif, they, they only stayed there for two weeks because the whole people from all around Mazar Sharif, the normal people, the old fighters who were fighting against Taliban, the veterans, they all went to the gates of Mazar Sharif, hold guns, and they wanted to fight against Taliban. Were you in Mazar Sharif during this time? Yes. Yeah, I was. I was in Mazar Sharif. I was again hopeful, and I said, "Okay, so probably everyone will fight against Taliban." And uh, then Taliban, I think, found out that they cannot take over Mazar Sharif, so they started their attack on other provinces. So Herat was the next province that became very unsafe. And suddenly Taliban started, they, they left Herat and they started attacking on Kandahar. So very soon they took over Kandahar, they took over Helmand. And then uh, at the end, uh, only Mazar and Herat remained. And Kabul. And, and, uh, and Kabul, yes. And uh, finally, in one day, all of them brought all their forces and they start attacking on Herat. And uh, uh, we were hopeful that the army will, will come to fight. But suddenly the government asked the army not to fight against Taliban. Did you still have clients when Herat and Mazar went down? Uh, well, at, at this point, I really lost my hope. When Herat fall, I was in Kabul. I, I, I didn't come. I didn't stay in Mazar anymore because I felt that, you know, Afghanistan is... Is, is lost. We just lost Afghanistan. But your wife and kids uh, were in Mazar. Yes, they were all in Mazar. And uh, when when we first he first started asking me questions like how I am, where I am, uh, at that time I, I was in Kabul. So that was the last flight that I got from Mazar to Kabul. After that, no flight happened, and lots of people remained at the airport. Like there were crazy crowd at the airport, and I was lucky with my kids and family to get out of Mazar at that point. Where, where were you hiding in Kabul, like a friend's house? Yeah, it was It was one of my cousin's house in a very crowded area of Kabul, so we were we were just staying indoor. Everybody kept messaging me, like, is Noor okay? Is Noor safe? Like, thousands of messages, man. And I know that you're smart with security. I, I see Daniel. Daniel! Yeah. Salam! Yeah. Kubi! Ah. Ah. Chatori, <laughs> remember me? Yeah, um, yeah. And I was in Kabul when Mazar fall, and uh, like uh, we were very sad, and uh, it was a crazy moment. Uh, just seeing Mazar in the hands of Taliban was just un, un, unforgettable. So, did you leave all your stuff in Mazar Sharif? Yes, uh, like the office, the house, the car, like whatever I had, it was just left behind. And I, I just came out with just a bag of clothing and my phone and computer and stuff like that. So, yeah, unfortunately, we, we just lost everything out there. Tell me about the moment when the Taliban took over, like the, the president left and the Taliban went inside the presidential palace. I watched it on TV crying. What happened when yeah. we were there? Uh, I was I was in Kabul that uh, uh, with some of our friends that, you know I had lots of normal contacts around uh, uh, like local based contacts with, for security uh, issues even when I was working uh, in, in field of tourism and stuff so one of my contacts called at the very far end of Kabul uh, which is like normally 15 kilometers away he called me that uh, nor where are you? And I said, I'm, I'm here in Kabul. And he said, you know, Taliban are here. 
And the Taliban were just behind their house and he could see the vehicle and the shouting and wow. stuff like that. He just told me that no Taliban are here. And it was it was really surprising for me. It was like, I, I, I believe Taliban took over Herat, Taliban took over Mazar, many other places, but I thought Kabul at least will stay two. maybe another one or two months. Me but too, man. Uh, yeah, just uh, on the day two, Taliban were just over there and uh, I was in, in shock, you know, I, I, I was totally in shock and it was unbelievable. And after just in two hours, Taliban reached to our areas where, where we were living, uh, right in the middle of the town. I didn't know what's going on. And uh, I, I, I was watching the news and everything. And uh, I found that the president is, uh, has also left Afghanistan. And yeah, that was the end of the hope in my heart and I totally lost my confidence. I, I, I give up, you know, I said, okay. So the president is gone, nobody's there. Taliban is in Kabul, there's nothing remaining. And, uh, and that was the moment when you realized you needed to get out of Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, that was the moment that uh, I thought, okay. Uh, and I, I just asked my wife that, you know, we need to get out. We cannot stay here anymore. What you're telling me is crazy because you, you're so proud of your country and you always, you're so resilient and you always hold back. And the moment w w when, when I hear you say that you have to leave, it just, it's, it, that means that like, it's worst case scenario. I mean, it literally means like it's life or death, right? Yeah. And also you, you, you remember Zablon Simentov. Uh, suddenly I remember that guy uh, in my mind. Suddenly I, I was worried about everything. Suddenly I was worried what's going to happen to Afghanistan, what's going to happen to the people, what's going to happen? Uh, suddenly, I remember Zablon. What, what's what's going to happen to Zablon? So, at the very last minute, uh, it was around 2 p.m. The Taliban uh, was right where we were, just outside on the streets, and uh, uh, the government was originally fallen. There was no police, nowhere. All the soldiers escaped. All the police escaped. Like the city was like totally evacuated, and uh, and it was Taliban everywhere. After two hours, uh, uh, my cousin was outside, uh, the one that I was leaving in his house. And I asked him, how is the situation? And he said, well, Taliban are everywhere, but it's just the beginning of everything. There was no shooting, no fight, because police didn't fight. They just left, and Taliban just came. And then for one or two hours, I was just in shock and waiting and thinking, and I didn't know what to do. And then finally, at four o'clock, I decided to go and meet Zablan. So I said, I will just have my normal turban, wearing my African clothing, and I would just wow. go in the crowd. And uh, I was really worried about this guy. And uh, I thought you, he was- You risked your to life me. to go meet him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just, uh, I knew Taliban are going to have checkpoints. So I didn't took my, my phone with me because I have lots of emails, photos of my clients and everything out here. So I, I picked a small little phone, which was belongs to my wife and I put my SIM card in and uh, I asked my wife that I want to meet a friend. She, she, she didn't like the idea. She was so worried. But I said, you know, I'm not sure when I'm going to meet Zevlon again. So let's let's just go to meet him. And, uh, and we found him just, through, through the video that I made is when you first met him. Yeah, to be honest. <laughs> wow, man. So, so then you went to go meet Zevlon and what happened? Yeah, uh, on the way there were, uh, I saw Taliban for the first time with their white flags everywhere. They were, it, it, it looked quite strange and crazy. And after a very, very long time, after like 20 years, I was seeing Taliban again. And uh, it was really heartbreaking. And the and they were using the, the beautiful vehicles, belongs to our army, belongs to our police. They were using them, you know, mm -hmm. and uh so first they, they had their checkpoint and they then they stopped they stopped our car and they asked the driver who we are where are we go and we just said we're just normal people we're moving from one side to another side we want to buy some grocery and stuff like that and then he went through our pocket and checked everything he wanted to make sure we're not maybe an army guy trying to escape yeah. or a yeah. government person they were just they just wanted to make sure so they they checked on my phone and everything. It was just a small little phone. It was not a smartphone. So yeah, they just let us go. And then there was another checkpoint and another checkpoint. So I passed three Taliban checkpoints and it was a crazy crowd because the traffic that was controlling the traffic in the city 
they, they all left. There was no traffic out there. So every car was going in every roundabout and then wow. there were, it, it was stuck out there. Thousands of thousands of people and cars just left in the middle of the town like that. And, you know, so uh, I, I tried to get out of the car and I started walking through the, the, the rush and the crowd. And uh, it was crazy moment. People didn't know what to do, where to go. Like everywhere was everyone was just stuck out there and i passed through the crash the 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 the, the, the rush and uh, actually there was no taxis as well so I, I walked a lot of like i walked for another 30 to 40 minutes suddenly i saw a car standing by road and i told him if they want to go somewhere so i hired the taxi again and i, I reached to zabla finally i and there was nobody and you, you remember that the alley where Zablon was living, it was a very crowded alley. Normally, there was lots of cars and people yeah. out there, businesses going on out there. So on that day, there was nobody, no single person was moving and there was no car and nothing. That was the first time I saw cobble that empty. So I walked into the road that Zablon was living and uh, finally I found the house and I started knocking and uh, someone finally came after like three, four times, like banging and finally someone came uh, i found that like nobody wants to open the door uh, i thought zablon is worried and they just locked the door from behind and uh, nobody was interested and finally a guy asked like who i am and i, I introduced myself zablon recognized me and then he said okay go open the door so that guy came and opened the door again he was a very close friend of zablon he was with zablon out there so he opened the door and he let me in and then I just went and say hello to Zablon and everything. And uh, so I asked Zablon that if you want to go somewhere safe. Uh, at, at the beginning he said, okay. And then literally, I don't know what crossed his mind. And he said, no. Yeah, I was always trying to uh, take Zablon to, to a safe house, to, to a guest house or something. And uh, for some reason he wants to stay here. He, he's stubborn, he doesn't listen to me. And I tried to really take him to somewhere which was safe to one of uh, uh, the guest houses that we were working but uh, he, he didn't accept finally and he said no he's fine and he's okay uh, actually I insisted but he didn't accept and then I said that if, if he wants to go to US because his friend asked me uh, and I, I tried to explain everything to Zablon and he said no I have lots of debts to pay and I have lots of deals here I have to look after the house that he's living out there, take care of the synagogue. So th these were the main reasons. And uh, I tried to tell him that the, the, the people in New York uh, is going to pay his debts mm -hmm. because they agreed to pay his debts. And uh, they're going to give you a house. You should leave. You know, it's, it's dangerous for you. And uh, he, he didn't accept. So I, I, I had to come back. And I just, I just told him, okay, I'm, I'm happy that you're fine. I just wanted to see you, so have a good time. And we just say goodbye to each other. Yeah, and I went back home again. It took like five to six hours for me to just meet Zablon. That just shows yeah, was, what, kind of, what kind of a person you are. You have such a good heart, man, that you went all the way through the Taliban checkpoints to go meet him. I want to I wanna get into some, some other details here. So, okay, so you realize you have to leave. And then you tried Pakistan, you tried India, you tried Turkey. You, tell me about the process of trying to scramble and find a visa. What happened? When I was in Kabul the first time, before going to Mazar and take my kids and come back, that was the time that we, I and you were talking about Turkey. And you said that you're going to help me. And uh, so I, I started trying to apply for, for, for Turkish visa. But uh, I found soon I found that there was 13,000 passports on the tables of Turkish embassy applying for visa. So it was impossible for me. And uh, the, the guy, the guys told me that it takes from one to two months to obtain a Turkish visa. Oh so I couldn't really wait for two months out there. So I said no. And then I tried uh, uh, India. India also took a week and then they said, okay, come next week. And then again, come next week. So it, I spent three, three weeks like that and, and nothing happened. The day that they asked me for interview, that was the day that Kabul fall. Oh. So, and- uh, And you just got new passports, right? You just renewed your yeah. passport? Like yes. just, you're yeah. like the last person to renew, right? Uh, probably, yeah. So I only, I only renewed, 
passport just when you were talking about going to Turkey. So just uh, I'm just, so happy that I pushed you to to go. If I didn't push you, maybe you would just sit back and not want to go. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, like when you were talking and you were worried about everything, and I said, okay. Like when Drew asks, let's let's do it. So, oh, uh, I yeah, I. <laughs> so finally, uh, the the other crazy thing was that my passport and everything was into the hands of the people who was supposed to take my Indian visa. Yeah, and suddenly, suddenly, Kabul was fallen. The embassy was closed everywhere was closed and i didn't have my passports and, and documents with me so I, I was making phone calls and all the phones and everything was off and uh, it was it was a really crazy moment so at this point i had the soft copies of my passports and documentations i applied for a pakistani visa Good. and pakistani visa also said that it might take more than two weeks i was at this point I, I just wanted to get out and i was applying everywhere yeah like it was another crazy story how i got my passports back from the people they were not replying the phone they were not answering and i was searching for them everywhere and finally i found them uh i paid some money as well because of my visa it was the prepayment i didn't even ask for my payment i just wanted my passports and everything back so finally i had i had them and at the very very last point a friend of mine who was helping me with the organization, with my little organization, her name was Sharon mm -hmm. uh, from Australia. She found a way to send us to Australia. She had a friend, uh, a senator in Australia. She, she was also worried about me. She was also asking, thank you so much for her too. Um, thank you, Drew. Like uh, uh, At this point, everyone was worried. Thanks to all my friends and people from around the world. I really appreciate all their worries and cares and prayers for me. Uh, lots, I was receiving lots of messages and uh, it seemed like lots of people were worried about me. And uh, finally, uh, Sharon talked to her friend, uh, the Senator friend, like in one day, everything was solved. And they said, they asked me to immediately go to the airport. So I grabbed my, my passports and everything. And in one day, everything was finalized and it was like a miracle. With your wife? With my wife and kids, yeah. So I've seen images of that airport. Tell me about yeah. what it was like to go to the airport. Sharon didn't only help me, he helped uh, like another 11 people. I mean, together with all of us, it was all 11 people. So Sharon passed all the contacts and we mm -hmm. made contacts with each other. We were like a group of 11 friends and people traveling together. And they said, okay, call these guys, gather in one place go to the airport so we made that contacts and I found the people and we came together all of us and we received an email from Australian embassy that said go to the northern gates of the airport of Kabul so we went to the north we found the northern gates and we found that thousands of thousands of people and crowd is waiting behind the gate of the airport Wow! and everywhere is controlled by Taliban they were shooting when people were trying to rush they were just shooting like like gunshots everywhere. So I couldn't take my children close by because Daniel and my little girl was really shocked and they were worried and they were scared. So I stopped the car very far away, back, back away. And then I started walking through the crowd and like Taliban were so harsh to people, they were hitting everybody, and uh, they were even hitting with their guns. Like like when when they were like crazy, they were just shooting, and pushing people back. Like thousands of people, they had documents. They wanted to go in the airport. They had a flight to leave, but nobody cared about them. So from two o'clock in the afternoon uh, until three o'clock the next day, we were waiting behind the gates of the airport. No food. No food, no. Uh, at, at this point, it, like the only thing we wanted to go was just to go in the airport. We, we didn't care about anything else. Uh, it was a huge crowd out there and uh, there was no food, no restaurant close by. And uh, we only had some bottles of water and uh, just a, a, like two to three biscuits with us. And we were just trying to keep ourselves alive with those biscuits and water. It was, a, it was a crazy crowd out there. So it was like 3 a.m. 
I heard that they're going to open the gate. So the whole flood of the population found this news suddenly, and all of them just pushed behind the ba- the gate of the airport. Yeah. All the men were just pushing, and women were pushing, and there were children out there. But luckily, I didn't take my children with me. <clears throat> they were behind. It was just me and Got two it. of my friends. So we went there. We just wanted to make sure once we go in the airport, we wanted to talk to the uh, Australian delegations out there. Yeah. Yeah. showing all our visas yeah. and documents yeah. and everything and then I, we were hoping that they might help us to get our kids because yeah. in that pushing and buskashi uh, absolutely we couldn't make it at this point i saw two kids in front of my eyes who were lost from the hands of their mummies they were just mm. gone and later on i found that they were died out there um, in uh, below the feet of the people and the crowd and uh, yeah just it was a very horrible moment and uh, a, a woman started shouting and crying and uh, at this point she she forget about getting into there but she were asking about her her her, her daughter and uh, people pushed back a little bit but there was nothing out there below my feet i saw ha- hundreds thousands of shoes just left behind because when people were making push like this pushy crowd mm. they were losing their shoes out there they're losing their document i saw passports i saw certificates working for americans for any other organizations because when when it was too pushed they were losing their documents from their hand and they couldn't take it back because it was crazy crowd out there i saw mobile phones out there i saw passports out there but nobody had the courage to go down and pick them because once you lose something you just lose it you you cannot go down to pick it up because it was like like people are just packed like this and uh, when, when i saw that 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 mommy was shouting and yelling for help and nobody uh people were trying to help but nobody was able to help because we couldn't see the child i really wanted to help but i i saw there was no child out there the child was just lost i don't know where where was it it was below the feet of people i don't know but i i couldn't see child out there and the mom was just shouting and and hitting herself and it was a it was a horrible moment and uh and when I saw that woman crying and shouting and nobody helping, and I, it was, it was a, a feeling of horror just came to me. And suddenly I was scared and I tried to back out. I said, okay, I'm not, I'm, we, we cannot make it to the airport. Let's just get out of here. I just got out and uh, I asked all the other friends and shouted them and found them and asked them to get out. Let's, let's leave here. It's, it's, it's impossible to go to the airport from here. So we went back to the car and uh, it was a bad news for my wife as well. I told her that it's impossible to go to the airport and she was sad as well. Like all other friends were all uh, were worried as well. And, and finally I said, okay, let's try another gate. It was now four o'clock in the morning. We took the taxi, uh, we, we passed the crowd and we went to another gate of the airport. We found another gate uh, in the Eastern side of the airport. When we reached there, it was again like, thousands of thousands of people packed behind that gate and uh, I think it was American soldiers all of them standing out there with their guns and they were not allowing anybody to go close the gate and we waited there for like an hour and finally we found that it's impossible to go to the airport from here as well so I said let's try another gate so I was not trying to give up I was trying to find a way to go in. No, which gate is the one that we always go to when we go to the airport? Uh, that was that was the southern gate. That's the main yeah. gate of the airport. That's the that gate, gate I, was, I know in my head, yeah. Yeah, that's the gate that was totally controlled by Taliban. So nobody was even allowed to go close to that gate. So wow. Taliban were just shooting directly at people. Six, seven people died out there with direct shooting. So nobody uh, wanted to go to that gate. So... Again, we tried for the third time, and then uh, I found a gate uh, where there were British soldiers. The nice thing was that these British soldiers were talking to people. And I asked that British guy that uh, I just went, there was lots of British soldiers standing, and I told him that, look, we have documents, you want to go into the airport, how we can go there finally. And he showed me another way that, look, go through that way, and then finally you can get out of the airport. I. I looked at that way and I saw uh, maybe a million people pushing out there to go through that gate. So everywhere, it was pack of people everywhere. And again, I asked for my, my children uh, and my wife to stay in the car. 
I, I said, I'm going to make it through. Once I'm at the Australian delegation, I will let them know and find, maybe they will help us. So I hit myself again at the heart of the crowd. This location uh, that I'm talking about, it's exactly the locations that it, two crazy explosion happened three days later. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Oh. Yeah, this, this is exactly the location I'm talking about. So I was at this location and I passed through many, many people. It took five hours for me to, pass, to, to go through 50 meters. And your wife was it just sitting five... in the car with your kids? Yes, yes. I, at, at this point, I was alone. So I made, I made through the, the crowd. After five hours, I made like, uh, for, I, I went through 50 meters and finally I was at the location where the British soldiers were looking at the documents of people. Yeah. So finally I reached myself to the British soldiers and they were so rude and they were like using lots of bad words for people. And then they were really impolite and it was a very uh, crazy moment for me. It was at this point, I saw lots of people because there was a ditch of septic water passing by. Even lots of people were trying to have a shortcut to throw themselves in the water. That was, you know, all water from septic and it was really dirty and smelly and it was like horrible to go into that water. But I saw lots of people jumped into the water trying to pass and then get up and then go oh. to the other side. Yeah, uh, I made through this and finally I saw the, the, the British soil and I told them that I want to see an Australian delegations. And finally, they didn't allow me to go there. They called an Australian guy. He came and he saw my documentations. And uh, he said, he asked me where my wife and children are. And I said, they're outside. I, I, it was only me who made through the crowd. And he said, you need to go bring your children through the crowd oh. and then come to us. And I said, oh my God, you know, what? <laughs> I told him there is a way out there. You can just call them and they can pass. You know, this is the documents and we just want to go yeah. into the airport. And he said, no, it's impossible. You need to go through the crowd and get in. Oh, God. And they just they just nicely showed me the way out. And then again, I was out. I, after six hours of trying, I was again at the spot where I just began, you know. Oh, my God. And by this time, it was noon. It was like almost 12 o'clock. Oh, my so God, I asked, man. Yeah, it was it was a really crazy moment, and I was really pissed off, and I didn't know what to do. And you know, my you know, my, my whole body was wet. You know, my clothes and like everything was just wet. It looks like I I jumped into the water and came out. It was Fine. just like that because it was too pushy and hot, and it was like a crazy sport. It's like a boost catching, you know. Yeah. Like my whole body was wet because uh, because of sweat that was coming out of my body. And so what happened when you went back to your wife and son, kids and told them what happened? Uh, finally, I, I asked him, okay, guys, let's have a lunch. Prepare yourself. We need to have a buskashi here now. I, I, I went up and down. I, I found some food, you know, some biscuits and some water. And there was some cans of energy drinks I bought. And then I just gave it to everybody and said, look, drink this energy drink. The weather was very hot. The sunshine was just out there. And I said, uh, we need to make through this crowd. Prepare yourself for a five hours fight in a Buskashi ground. Uh, after we had our lunch, I put Daniel on my shoulder. Daniel was very heavy and I was very tired. I had my backpack with me. Uh, I had my wife taking care of the baby and uh, the other friends. We again started from zero through the people. And it took another three to four hours for us to push through the people, get to that soldiers where I was there five, six hours before. Yeah. yeah. And uh, previously in the morning that I came, it was uh, a little, uh, for, for lots of time that the sun was not out. It was not that hot, but this time it was very hot. I saw people like uh, falling down out of heat and th there was no water out there. So the, I bought some bottles of water with us as well to just refresh us during the this uh, crazy trip. At this point, uh, I saw another two child was lost here. I saw their bodies that people tried to get them out. I saw old women and uh, I saw a, a woman fall from the bridge into that septic water. He, she hurt himself, herself as well. And it was like a very sad and crazy moment. And, and at this point, I was really uh, emotional. And I was just asking to God that why is doing this to our people? 
why everybody have to leave the country like this, why people want to die here and they hate Afghanistan and they hate the regime and everything. I mean, what makes people to leave Afghanistan like this? The days before I saw people falling from the air for, from the airplane, many people died in the shootings. And today people are dying just in the crowd. They lose their life, but they want to leave Afghanistan. What's, what's going on here? So finally, uh, it was a very painful moment. And uh, at some point I was also very tired. Daniel was just like that on my shoulder. He's very heavy. He's like, I don't know, like 20 to 25 cages. I don't know. And uh, I have to hold Daniel like that for hours. And I had to push through because you need to fight. You need to push, you know, like again, sweat. Your, my whole clothing and everyone's clothing was totally wet because we were, it was like a heavy, crazy practice out there like a, a crazy sport. So we we finally made it again. My wife was very tired and everyone was tired. I was just trying to encourage everybody to not to give up, try to be strong. You know, people needed fresh air and there was no fresh air. I was, you know, it was a crazy moment. Finally, after a lot of pushings and crazy moments, we, we again reached to that uh, British soldiers. And I again showed them my documents. And then again, I asked him that I needed to see the Australian delegation. They called an Australian soldier out there. He came and he looked at our papers and then he said, okay, no, it's not enough. And I don't know, like crazy sentences. And I told him that I was here in the morning. You guys accepted everything. Look, this is the letter. This is the experience that I have. My life is in danger. And uh, this is the letter from your senator. This is the letter from your guy. I showed them the emails and everything. And finally he said, okay, I'm going to talk to other of the others. Then he went and talked to one of his boss. And then the boss came and I, I tried to talk to him. And finally he allowed me to go into the airport. So yeah, that's, that's how we went into the airport. <laughs> so I'm now trying to write a story about that. So you get in the airport and then what happens? And then uh, it was a lot of people out there, the people who got there before us they were registering us and they were checking us we had to wait and then a car was coming and taking us and then they were taking to the australian section of the mm-hmm. airport uh, when we reached when we reached to the australian section well to be honest the the soldiers were really nice they were very kind uh, i really need to appreciate the australian soldiers at this point who were really helpful and they tried their best to help us. Mm-hmm. And then they took us to a location. I think it was a detention center. Mainly mm-hmm. uh, prisoners were kept there. And by the time that we reached there, uh, they actually didn't have a facility to take care of us out there. They were only letting us to go in, but they didn't have anything, like no room, no, no bed, nothing. It was just on the ground open area ground fenced around and uh, it was just plain plain land out there like grass growing soil so they said okay find a place suit yourself and sleep here and I was like what give us something we need to we need a blanket or something but he said we don't have any blanket nothing you need to pass the night like this it was 11 o'clock at night when we reached inside this uh, location so I, I was searching around to find maybe a piece of carton or a piece of cloth or something to throw out there and sleep on. Uh, we couldn't find anything. So I finally went back to the Australian soldier and, so, and I told him that, OK, at least give us something, maybe a piece of carton or a piece of cloth, something to sleep on. He said, how many people we are? I told her, I told him that we are four people, two children and uh, two adults. And he went and came back and gave me one carton he said this is for the two kids so i don't care about the the adults you go do something i don't know and i said okay so i got that carton and i came and i asked daniel and the baby to sleep on that carton and we ourselves we didn't have anything so we just slept on the ground like that and it was very cold at night so the whole night we couldn't sleep the previous night we also didn't sleep because we were behind the gate of the airport so this night we also couldn't sleep and it was like really cold. We were just shaking the whole night. And it was so in the morning, I was totally sick. Like I had a runny nose and, and we I had some clothing in my bag. I just put it on Daniel and the baby. I didn't want them to get cold and sick. So and the other friends as well. Many other people were there. All of them had the same situation and uh, until the next day. So the next day when the sun shined, it was a bit warmer. 
So it was <laughs> like when the sun shined, like, thank God it was like heaven because our body was getting uh, warm a little bit. And, uh, and then uh, at this point they were uh, accepting uh, passports and documents. Yeah. When, it, it, when it became eight o'clock, the officials came, they put a table out there with some chairs and they started asking people. So they, people were going and uh, they had four flights from Kabul to, to Dubai that day. Mm -hmm. for Australian military flights. Finally, at the end of the day, it was totally dark that uh, it was my turn. So we gave all the documentations and uh, they, they put us on the last flight at 12 o'clock and then we reached to Dubai around four or five. How many people were on the flight? Around two to two, two, 250 people in the flight. Oh, so there were actual so, seats. There were seats on the plane. No, no, no. It's a, it's, it's a military plane. So people just go and sit on the ground. But it took you three days, almost two and a half, to get from the moment you arrived at the airport until you got on the plane. Yeah. Oh, my God. And, uh, and finally, we were in Dubai. And once we reached in, in Dubai, I don't know where it was in Dubai. But we had no idea. It was just all military. All military sections belong to the Australian government. How did you feel so they when, you, when you arrived? Uh, it was a feeling of relief, actually. So it was the feeling that I thought, okay, we're going to survive now. We're going to, we're going to be fine. Chi me khuri Daniel? Ah, This is our land here. That's good. Alhamdulillah. And uh, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so at at this point, they they gave us food. They gave us fruits. So it was really nice. After a long time, we were having eating an apple. It was so tasty like uh they did our covid tests and everything and hopefully after a while i found that we were all negative and then they took us to a camp it was a nice place uh they, they gave us rooms out there but because there were too many people i, I think there were like more than two thousand people in that camp so they were separating men from women so they took my wife to another <clears throat> dorm where all the women were there and they took me and my daniel to uh, another dorm where all men were there. So they separated us from each other. And it was a room with 14 bunks inside. So they gave us a bunk and uh, we were sleeping out there. And uh, for one week I was there. So by this time, sometime we were chatting as well. We didn't have internet. So I was trying to move around and yeah. find some Wi-Fi, very yeah. weak signals. And I was just trying to connect myself for any Wi-Fi signals I was finding. And we were waiting in lines, like hundreds of people waiting in one line to wait for the food. So oh, when I had right. to have a lunch, I had to go there two hours before. 12 o'clock, they were providing lunch. So I was going there at 10, waiting in line for two hours until it was my time. So we were receiving food. So we are um, in the line for lunch here. Big line of food. But you were safe in Dubai. So as soon, yes, as, you, yes, as, soon yes. as you got there, was, they, they had a bed for you. They had food and then... And then eventually you got yeah. on the plane to Australia? Yes. And after, after like five days, my name was on the list to fly to Australia. Uh, we went there. We did all the, the paperwork. We were checked. Everything was fine. I could go into the plane. And then before that, they, they were just doing our biometrics and fingerprints. Mm -hmm. At the fingerprints, they found that I had another fingerprints in 2007. And it was at the U.S. Embassy. You know the yeah. story, <laughs> but with a different birthday. And, Who cares uh, about your birthday at this point? Just yeah. get you safety, man. Yes, and uh, they said, you know, you have a different birthday, sir. You cannot fly today. And I said, oh my God, please let me get into that plane. So um, finally, after like ten days uh, waiting here in Dubai. I finally have my boarding pass and everything. That's a good news. Four days ago, they brought me here, uh, out there on that table. Uh, I tried to explain that I was a kid. I was going for education to US. I couldn't make it. I was rejected. And he said, you know, you have a different birthday. We need to fix that. And they just sent me back to the compound. Mm. And after this, it was really boring for me to stay in this compound. And uh, <clears throat> the guy said that I'm going to 
get you on the next flight as soon as possible. But it took other five days for me and mm. many flights left. And I was really worried because I thought I'm going to leave behind, you know, because he said as soon as possible. And now it's five days with many flights left and like almost the whole compound was emptied. And I was one of the very few people left behind with my family that finally they read my list, my name on the list. And it was a very happy moment. And the next time, the next morning we flew, it was a long flight. It's like 15 hours. It took 15 hours. You arrived in Melbourne and they took care of you and now you're there. Yeah, we arrived in, in Melbourne. It was just like a new life here, like a new heaven and uh, people very nice. Everybody taking care of us. Everybody is helping with us, holding the baby, you know, showing us the way everywhere you go. Like they talk to you with very respect. Somebody is coming to give you food. Somebody is coming to give you water. And uh, finally, we're here at the at the hotel. They're they're really taking good care of us. Every morning they call us and ask us if we have a problem, if we need medicine, if we need food or water or clothes, whatever. No worries. Uh, yeah. So a special Here. thanks to the government of Australia and the people of Australia that they're the best. They're really nice. And uh, we really remember this historical moment of our life wow I, I there's a lots of emotions that i'm feeling but first off i'm so happy that you're safe I, i'm terribly sorry that you had to go through all that pain and misery man that's just so brutal yeah. and, and i mean i saw the explosion that happened right after you left i mean yeah unfortunately yeah. unfortunately 200 people were almost were killed and yeah you were so resilient, man. You were so strong. I can imagine. I, I closed my eyes because I've been to that airport eight times because I've had to go, you know, flying from Tehran. Fly. I've been to that airport almost 10 times probably. And I'm yes. imagining you pushing there, sweating with Daniel on your shoulders and you just didn't give up. You could have, you could have given up. You could have said, all right, we're going back to my cousin's house and we're going to wait yeah. a couple more days. And if, if you waited a couple more days, you'd be stuck there because right. there's, there's no more right. flights now. So yeah. I admire your courage. Um, I, I'm just so happy that you were able to get out safely with your family, with your kids. And um, man, I'm sure there are people that are going to be watching this video um, that are in Melbourne who can offer help and, and you have a new life and a new new friendships and new communities. And, and you know, you're a very smart guy. You're very educated. Yeah. You speak perfect English. And I'm, I'm very sure that you will find um, a nice community there, a, a great job. And, you know, stay there as long as you need for safety and 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 i'm just very very happy man so you know i get the goosebumps you know the feeling in your arm because th this is oh, all stemming from my first trip to afghanistan in 2018 right and then i made all those videos there and that that helped you know introduce you to a lot more people so i just feel very grateful that i was able to to help contribute um even if i didn't personally get you into australia just helping further the conversation um no it was it was so nice of you thank you drew for all the the process and your trips for afghanistan it was so nice of you we through your lens uh we were all able to show afghanistan to lots of lots of people lots of new chances and yeah. gates open for me and for afghanistan and uh, of course if you were not there I was not at this point right now and uh, everything was perfect. Uh, we had good times. Thank you for all your efforts and care right. and prayers for me, Drew. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here finally safe. And Dude. thanks for making this video and of creating course, this man. story. In it. You know that we're going to be friends for life. I will be seeing you in, in Melbourne as soon as uh, it's open. The country's closed right now, but <clears throat> as soon as this COVID mess passes, I'm going to come out and hang out with you guys and I just want to let you know, Afghanistan just has a very special place in my heart. You can see the flag on my wall. The picture from the uh, photographer, it's, it's in the wall in front of me, the the 100-year-old camera. It's right yeah, here. Okay. And then I got something in Bamiyan, which is on my wall over there. So I think about Afghanistan all the time. It's terrible what's happened, um, but I'm so happy that you're safe. And I hope to see you soon, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Drew. Uh, wish you a good life wish you a good life with your beautiful lady and uh thank you for all of this of course Noor, man I, I, absolutely and, and listen i will see you soon like if if it opens yeah. in six months i'm coming down in six months to see you so inshallah yeah
it, yeah, they, they say it's it's it's, it's uh, they say it's going to open soon. So hopefully, I will yeah. absolutely come, man. I will see you down there in Melbourne. And it's a, by the way, you're in my favorite city in Australia. So, anyways, yeah. thank you for your time. Please send my blessings to your your beautiful wife. And now it seems like Daniel and and Deanna are gonna grow up with a with a thick Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes once they, once they learn how to speak english they're going to be talking like an aussie which is which is actually yeah. funny um yeah. so hey i'm so happy to see you smiling and, and and everything and um we'll be in touch man yeah yeah that, that's great Drew. thank you so much have a have a good day and uh have a good time thank Tasha you cool, Lala John. Yeah. Tasha cool, Lala John. have a good <laughs> okay. day see you later yeah. man yeah bye yeah. bye thank you nor so happy that you're safe man i love you bro you're the best. Afghanistan. Uh, I don't, I'm just speechless. I really hope for the best for all you guys. And I hope you guys can get out safely. And, and thank you guys for tuning into this video. If you are interested to donate, I'm putting links below to some fundraisers that have been started by um, people I know or their friends. So they're reputable sources. If you want to contribute to, to Noor, to his colleagues, to other tour guides and drivers in Afghanistan, and to those who need it most, um, you can find the links below in the description. And i um, just happy that Noor's safe. All right, well, you heard the story from him. Nothing more for me to say. Thanks for watching.